So, welcome to this interview, Real Miller. You are a well-known futurist from Experidox. And we are here in University of Helsinki in a seminar on the future of uh, research and science and future studies. And you gave us an interesting presentation today. And for Finland Futures Academy and Finland Futures Research Center, I'd like to ask you some questions. So in futures research, uh, much more emphasis is now being put on futures design, yes. creating the futures, futures creation. And of course, this requires a lot of creativity yes. put into the field of futures research. How could we promote and enhance creativity in future studies? Uh, it's a very good question, and you're absolutely right that it's something that's, that's quite topical and, and uh, generates a lot of interest. Um, I would say that the, the, the design issue is really the critical question. In what part of the process do you uh, create the openness uh, for creative thinking? And so it's, to me, very much an issue of choosing the constraints and the tools and creating permission, giving permission. Um, and that, that's not necessarily that easy because people are often quite inhibited. They need permission. But at the same time, I've discovered that, generally speaking, if people are just given permission without being given tools, they don't do things that are very inventive. They end up just repeating things that they've heard or they just mix things together and you get rather um, uh, expected uh, outcomes. Um, those of us who spend time with people thinking about the future uh, can certainly, uh, I think, all share in the idea that most of the time people just repeat trends that they've heard in the newspaper or trends that they've been speaking about amongst themselves and they don't uh, actually think about different ways of doing things, different possible configurations of economic, social, governance, uh, resources, uh, environment. They don't really look at a, a, a different world. Yes, so actually it's difficult to step out of the box thinking and uh, start thinking differently. Exactly. So, so but what is in your opinion, um, could you single out the most creative method in futures research that is uh, clear this uh, is difficult, but... Uh, I'm a great believer in context. In other yes. words, what's, what's a breakthrough and out of the box for one context is not necessarily a breakthrough and out of the box for another context. Uh, but as I said in my talk, uh, I, I think that it's important to let people uh, initially explain themselves, talk about the future in, in ways that are comfortable and familiar to them, and then to give them tools, uh, particularly, I think, analytical tools and narrative tools, which means that you have to create a, a stage and you have to put things on the stage that they then play with. Uh, and so it's really creating that, that framework and that stage and giving them tools that will push their thinking and make them, f force them to invent new ways of using the things that you've put on the stage, new ways of interacting. Yes, actually uh, that reminds me, it's very close to our research project which is called Creative Foresight Space, yes. where we try to provide a mixture of different methods and tools and stimulate both creativity and future thinking. So uh, it is a pilot, it is uh, now constructed in, in as a hybrid space and actually do you think, um, is there a potential or where do you see the biggest potential for such a hybrid space, creative foresight mm -hmm. space? Uh, it can be used for education, for companies, for public administration and for citizens, for example, one pilot was set in, in a library. Yes. So yeah. there is a lot of potential, but could you uh, see some specific potential in Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I believe very much that exercises, uh, you know, like stretching, <laughs> can be yeah. very effective yes. for helping people uh, with mental gymnastics. And so if you create a, a, a like a gymnasium, uh, it's a place where people know that that's what they're allowed to do, they're expected to do it, uh, and that encourages them to, 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 to use the music 
and to work uh, with the new ideas. Again, it, it, I think it's quite important to co-design the space and the tools uh, so that you find out those things which are disruptive and which are uh, going to be, uh, which will help them cross boundaries, identify boundaries and cross boundaries. And in each context, that's different. So as somebody who does futures work as a futures professional, you can't really know in advance. What you know is you know what you're looking for, and you can work with people to find it. Uh, but what, I, what, you, what you put on the stage or in the, in, the, in the mental gymnasium for creativity depends very much on the specific context. Okay, yes. And you yourself have proposed the concept of futures literacy. How to read the futures. It is a competence of future thinking, futures yeah. consciousness consciousness even, uh, do you include writing and drawing the futures uh, also in this uh, concept yeah, of futures literacy and making the futures as the, well? Well, the, 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 there's many different uh, ways of understanding how the way we use the future changes the present. So we act in the present, we perceive in the present. Uh, and the way we act and perceive are deeply influenced by the way we imagine the future. So what I am interested in, in terms of futures literacy, is developing the storytelling capacity, the narrative capacity, to invent alternative worlds, to understand system boundaries, and also what we're doing when we extrapolate, uh, and what we're doing when we think we can impose our uh, views, our hopes on the future, uh, and that that's one particular way of using the future, but not the only way of using the future, and may even be a, a, sometimes a way of using the future that gets you to the exact opposite result. So this question of, of, of how to use the future effectively is something that I think we need to be developing uh, yes. uh, as, a, as a competence. Uh, and I'm glad to see in Finland and other places people are working on how to develop that capacity. Yes, there has to be m many efforts yeah. towards that. But what is the actually the first step in companies who want to start developing their futures literacy besides, of course, this awareness of the urgency of futures thinking? But well, for companies, it's, it's, it's very often uh, um, a question of being able to distinguish between what they, uh, amongst what I call the three different kinds of futures that they're, they're thinking about. So there are some companies that are thinking about emergency situations and how to save themselves if there's a crisis. Uh, I know that at the time of uh, uh, the influenza, when there was SARS, when there was a, there were a number of companies that said, well, what happens if people can't go to work? How do we prepare for that? Uh, these were companies that were in uh, real time, uh, you know, on time services telephones, things like that. What happens yes. if people can't go to work? Yeah. So there they were doing contingency futures. Yes. They were preparing for emergencies. Um, other companies are thinking, how can we uh, go directly into the smartphone market, like Nokia? And so they have an idea of a smartphone, and they want to get there. That's what I call optimization futures. And there's a number of different paths. They can keep with uh, Symbian. <laughs> they could go to Android. Yes. Uh, they could do different ways of getting to the smartphone uh, market. Um, or you can look at emergence and ask the question, what are emerging and what new systems are being created that would actually alter the nature of the smartphone, mobile phone system, uh, and how can you play a role in that emergence? And that's a much more open-ended, much more exploratory, much more um, uh, uh, greenfield way yes. of thinking. Uh, all three of those approaches to the future are viable in companies, but it depends what they want to do. Yes, how about then search for radical innovation? Is it this third class especially? Well, but you can be you can be radically innovative probably for emergencies. You can be radically innovative for from your own point of yes. view for achieving the smartphone goal. Yes. Because um, uh, radical, again, is context. It depends on where you're starting yes. from. Um, but if the interest um, is to be strategic, which means to question your goals. Yes. Because if you assume the goal and you say this system, smartphones, will always be there and that's where we want to be, um, then you are not 
then you've decided on your strategic objective and you're not actually having a strategic discussion, you're having a tactical discussion. How do I achieve my strategy? Yes. So you're not actually saying which strategy, you've decided which strategy. It's smartphones. And so in many cases it's difficult for companies uh, to make that choice uh, and to be clear about that choice. And that's one of the things that I think it's important for futurists to help them with, is to say, what, what do you want to do here? Do you want to just think about uh, a narrow uh, approach to your existing strategy? If you're going to be radical, you can be radical in that. Yes. Because for you it'll be very difficult. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're being radical strategically. You're being radical from an optimization point of view. So in all three kinds of futures, you can do things which are fairly disruptive if you have the right process where you're creative and also where you have the capacity to make the change. So, and here just to, to it seems to me that it's one of the important aspects of thinking about the future, that the process is the product. And that if you get people to develop and use the future themselves, then they can, they're better positioned to make the change than if some strategic group comes up with a new yes, vision yes. and says, here, this is where you should go. Yes. So there's a part of it that's really related to how the process is conducted. Yes. So you need to be yeah. clear about the kind of future, you need to be clear about the kind of process, and so that gives you a systematic approach. Yes, and the process has to be interactive at all levels. That's I think. it. Yeah. Uh, then let's also talk a little about the use of 3D worlds. Yes, that's okay. a second life. What kind of future prospects, applications, or trends do you foresee for 3D worlds? Well, I'm, I'm not somebody who talks about prediction uh, and what I think will happen, but I can say that, that uh, um, the, the world of avatars, uh, to me, seems to be a very promising way to in, in, enlarge the space for playing. Uh, and that playing is a very important way to learn. And so, to me, virtual realities, multiple identities, the use of avatars is a promising uh, field for play, and play is a very powerful way to learn. Uh, and not just learn um, in cognitive, but obviously with social networking, to learn about behavior and norms and rules and what it means to be polite, what it means to be impolite, what happens when you're impolite, what happens when you're aggressive, what happens when you're uh, too timid, uh, and to experiment with that. Uh, and to me that's a, a very positive thing because it, it gives us more opportunities to learn by doing. And I think learning by doing is a very powerful, uh, probably the most powerful way for humans to learn. And so the virtual realities and the 3D uh, worlds provide us with more opportunities to learn by doing without running some of the dangers and costs of doing it. <laughs> yes, it's like a testing field. Yeah. It provides us That's a right. platform exactly. for play and even serious play. Serious play. Yeah. Yeah. My final question is concerned with company strategy work. Yes. So you have somewhat criticized Nokia's current strategy uh, for being dull in a way. So what would you like to see in Nokia's strategy? How would you make it more attractive and dynamic? Well, in keeping with my point about not bringing fish, uh, but working with organizations so that they can do the fishing. I believe very much that the deep knowledge is in the company or in the ministry. And the key for me, and it's something actually I talked to Nokia about uh, five or six years ago, was how do you use the future to create shared uh, platforms for depth of knowledge? So how can the engineers and the marketing, how can the users and the strategy people, how can all the different parts of a company and its supply chain and its users communicate effectively without being forced to use the language of the foresight group or the engineering group uh, where on the one hand it's not easy for other groups to understand the language of the engineers or the language of the marketing people, but on the other hand it forces you to lose your knowledge because you then you then create a uniformity um, and oftentimes sometimes competition between the ideas. If you use the future and you create uh, shared images of the future, rich imaginary futures, people can bring the depth of their knowledge into that future and allow that future to give life to their knowledge and their imaginations. And that way, across a company, you can share the creativity. Uh, I'm a great believer in that kind of uh, open learning and that kind of uh, uh, 
collective intelligence to create evidence of change and emergence. And for me, that's a crucial uh, way of using the future inside a company to create new strategies. Yes, definitely a great challenge to develop collective intelligence. Yes. So thank you very much, Real Miller, for this interview. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, bye-bye.